welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and I'm the apostle for the restoration of the original first century faith. And in this second part of the video, Revelation Simplified, we want to talk about the Revelation timeline and the four horses of the apocalypse. So we, in this video series, we're only going to be able to cover a small amount of the information that you can find in the full study, Revelation in the End Times. You can read it free online at nazarenesrael.org. You can also download a PDF copy, or if you prefer, you can order a paperback from amazon.com. As we saw in part one of this video, the four horses of the apocalypse correspond each one to one of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. For example, the biblical patriarch Joseph and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, correspond to the white horse, or Protestantism. Esau corresponds to the red horse, which represents Catholicism in Rome. Uh, also, there's some uh, humanism and communism and these sorts of things associated with Rome. Judah represents the black horse, and Ishmael represents the green horse, and we'll talk a lot more about them as this study continues. But one of the most important things that helped me so much in understanding the book of Revelation was to understand that there is a timeline to the book of the Revelation. And it's a little bit difficult to see it at first because we have two kinds of chapters in the book of the Revelation. We have what we call the inset chapters and we also have what we call timeline chapters. Now the timeline basically is the chronology. It's the storyline. It's the story within the story in the book of the Revelation. So it can be difficult to see because there are also inset chapters, or sometimes we call them informational chapters or overlay chapters, or you might think of them as a, a breakout chapter. These inset chapters give a lot more information to the story, but they don't necessarily advance the storyline. They give so much detail, uh, sometimes they do move the story forward, and sometimes they don't move the story forward, or they take it in a different direction. And sometimes it can be difficult to see because the first three chapters actually are informational chapters. So it takes three chapters to realize that you're even looking at a timeline. And this is just one of the things, one of the reasons I believe why the timeline in the book of the Revelation has been hidden up until this particular point in time. But what I want to do now is I want to take you to a graphic and we're going to talk just a little bit about this graphic. This is a, a very simplified version. I studied the book of the Revelation for many years because I'm very interested in uh, where is the end taking us to. So uh, after I'd studied it for many years, I got together at the Feast of Tabernacles with a group of people, and we covered an entire wall with two big rows of butcher paper. And we took every single verse from the book of the Revelation and put them all in sequence and took every other verse that we could think of that could apply to this in that particular location. And you see a simplified version of that, uh, both on the website and in the book study. And then this is a simplified version of that. So basically, Revelation begins with the assemblies. And as we said, it's three informational chapters. But now, so everything that you're going to see listed in this, I don't know how you, your screen views, but if you're able to see the difference, Everything that's listed in the pale yellow is an inset or an informational chapter or the information covered belongs to it. So the assemblies, again, three informational chapters, but notice second column from the right, there are also informational chapters. So now if you're trying to read the timeline, you're reading from left to right, top to bottom. But then notice every time you bump into an inset, the storyline doesn't advance at that point. So anything you can see in blue or dark blue, or it may show up as uh, blue and sort of a uh, seafoam green or something like that, uh, those are timelines. So you read those left to right, top to bottom, and everywhere you bump into the pale yellow, that's an inset or an informational chapter. We're going to come back to that, but what we want to see is so we have the seven assemblies, and then we have seven seals that are opened. We're going to talk about the first four of those seals in this video because they correspond to the four horses. We're meeting the cast of characters again. We're meeting the patriarchs in more detail and understanding their operations in the modern day. 
and then we're going to get into seals five six and seven in the next part of this video series so there's so much information right now i just want to show you basically a, a very simplified version of the simplified version so we call this the basic timeline so the seals we're going to see play out over thousands of years and the trumpets correspond we believe to a seven-year tribulation and the second half of that seven-year tribulation is what's known as the time of jacob's trouble uh, this is going to be an extreme time of difficulty both in the land of israel and abroad these correspond to the seven thunders which are presently sealed up then after the judgment after babylon is judged at the seventh trumpet then we have the cup judgments are poured out and babylon is destroyed uh, then there's a final so after babylon is destroyed there's an additional final battle which is the Battle of Armageddon, which as we'll see later in this video series, also is the wedding feast. It's kind of counterintuitive that a wedding feast and a great final battle should be the same thing, but uh, we'll see that's coming up. So, but people say, Norman, how do we understand this? Give, give me something easier to remember all this detail by. So we have, if you wish, uh, if we wish to accept it, the parable of the pregnant bride. So if Israel, so to speak, or the Nazarene Israelites, received the, received the spirit in the first century, uh, if we liken this to uh, Israel basically becoming a pregnant bride. So the seals, which play out over thousands of years, they represent a growing burden, just as a woman's burden grows larger over a span of nine months. Then the trumpets would correspond to her labor pain, the thunders would correspond to her cries of pain. The cups would represent her waters breaking. And then Armageddon is when a redeemed man-child, redeemed Israel, is born. So we'll talk more about that mnemonic. But in Revelation 6 and verse 1, now we're definitely into the timeline here. This is something that advances the chronology forward. In other words, the story is being told. So in Revelation 6 and verse 1, it says... Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So when Yeshua returns in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, he's riding a white horse. And we believe, however, that in this particular context, we're speaking not about Yeshua, but about Yeshua's body. And in particular, by the white horse, we're referring to the house of Joseph and also his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And since Ephraim will not know his true identity until after Armageddon, basically at this particular moment in time, we're talking about Protestant Christians. And when we say Protestant, basically what we're getting at is these are Yeshua's people in that they value the words of Yeshua and his father over the words of the Pope. So in addition to that, we also know that the white horse effectively is warlike. So Yahweh is a man of war, but in Jeremiah 51 and verse 20, that we're told about Ephraim, Yahweh says, you, Ephraim, are my battle axe and weapons of war. For with you, I will break the nations in pieces. With you, I will destroy kingdoms. So, but before they were the Protestant people, they were part of a Catholic Europe. And this is important information. We cover this in the Nazarene Israel study. What is commonly referred to as the great falling away is when the house of Ephraim or the white horse went into Rome. So the story goes that in the first century, originally there were the Nazarenes. And so the Nazarenes were just those who followed Yeshua and they did as he did, practicing his, we might say, Jewish version of Christianity or more accurately called Christian Judaism. But alongside the sect of the Nazarenes arose other Hellenized believers. We read about these in Mark chapter nine and verse 38. We speak about them in other places. 
these are those who didn't have the same connection to the Torah. They also didn't have the same connection to Yeshua's halacha. So these are those who, when they went outside the land of Israel, would become known as the Christianos or the Christians. In, and then in 311 CE, Emperor Constantine converted to a form of Christianity, at least it is alleged, and then he went on from there. After he became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire, he effectively merged Christianity with the Roman pagan sun worship of the day, Mithraism, to create a new Catholic or universal faith. And then with the power of the Roman legions behind them, Rome banned all other variations of the faith. And so effectively, Rome was the only game in town. And if you weren't uh, doing Rome's thing, you were dead. So this is what it means, as we explain in Nazarene Israel, in Daniel 7 and verse 25, it says, Then the saints, referring to Joseph and his sons, shall be given into his hand, into the little horn's hand, into the papacy's hand, for a time and times and half a time, which, as we show in the Nazarene Israel study, works out to some 1,260 years. People ask, uh, what does this 1,260 years represent? And there's no exact start and stop dates to it, but we believe it generally refers to the period of time when the Roman Catholic Church doctrine was being solidified from the late 200s to the early 300s, and then until the time of the Protestant Reformation, which began in 1517. Some people place the sinking of the Catholic Spanish Armada by the Protestant English Navy to be significant in 1588. And then also in 1648 CE, there was signed the Treaty of Westphalia. So at least there is a, you might call a named truce between the Catholics, the Red Horse, and the Protestants, the White Horse. So, but this is we need to understand that that's what we're dealing with here is a mixing between the white and the red horses so the notice the we might call a crusader or a christian soldier in the middle Uh, so he's got the white horse tunic on and then he's got holding a shield which usually was white and then with a red cross and the thing is that the cross represents, as we show in other places, the cross is the sign of Tammuz, which is a sun worship god. So when we're talking about the red horse, we're talking about basically Luciferism, basically sun worship. And one of the problems is that during that 1,260 year period, it may be arguably correct that the Pope could have worn white, symbolizing the white horse. But after the Protestant, Protestant Reformation, the Pope no longer represents Ephraim, and the Pope should not be wearing white as his primary color. I wear white because I represent Ephraim. The Pope represents, his cardinals, I believe, wear red. And that actually, I believe, would be a more appropriate uh, color for the the Pope. And I believe Pope Benedict did wear red sometimes. It was a little bit uh, more accurate. So let's take a closer look at the red horse. In Revelation 6 and verse 3, says, and when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So the identity of Esau, I believe, ties to the color of red, which is blood. So when we take a look at Genesis 9 and verse 19, we see that these three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated or overspread. So what we're effectively saying is Esau is an appeal to mankind. It's an appeal to our common bloodness, red being the color of blood. So if we take a look, democracy, this is from Wikipedia, Democracy is defined as the rule of the people, literally, and whether they exercise that power directly or whether they elect representatives from among themselves to form a governing body, such as a parliament or a congress. Democracy is sometimes referred to as the rule of the majority. Now, this concept of the rule of the majority actually got started in 
Greece. So it's level three of the Babylonian statue that we've been speaking of. And then it was incorporated in Rome as level four of the Babylonian statue. So it should be no surprise that the rule of the people also shows up in level five of the statue, which is Christianity mixed with Islam. Now, but notice the similarity to what we see back in Tanakh or Old Testament times. So in Shoftim or Judges 17 and verse six, it tells us that in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So that's kind of what we're doing essentially when we vote, because when we vote, we're essentially casting our vote for whatever seems good and right in our own eyes. And people say, well, you know, if you can, uh, uh, if you have already a Judeo-Christian people who can be trusted to behave morally and righteously in this sort of thing, uh, then you can afford to have a democracy as long as the majority remains Christian. But that's not the case. That, that isn't what happens. Because Red Horse Esau, remember, Esau despised the birthright. Esau despised the kingship. And the problem is the kingship is literally, it's a duty. It's a servanthood before Elohim. It is a, essentially, it's a form of set apart office. So it has to be done right. It has to be done correctly. And for Esau to attempt to bring in the rule of the majority is not the correct thing to do. And it doesn't lead forward. So if we take a look at passages such as 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17, we see where Kepha or Peter tells us to honor the king. So when we have a kingship, uh, we couldn't stay obviously with the Roman kingship uh, after the Protestant Reformation, doesn't make any sense. Although we'll see the relationship in those later on. But back when Ephraim was still honoring the king, the king had every incentive to teach the people to read and believe their Bibles. But now in a secular world, there is no such need. And the red horse isn't interested in such beautiful ideals as white horse ideals, what Yahweh says, what Yeshua says, what the Torah says, what the Spirit is saying. Uh, red horse Esau is not concerned with that because he despises those sorts of things. So when we take a look at red horse Esau, we're talking about the bonds of blood. So what are we talking about? In ideologies, in uh, human terms, we're talking about humanism, democracy, socialism, communism, uh, these kinds of things that lead to peace being taken from the earth because it takes Yahweh's order from the earth. Of course, we didn't have Yahweh's order under Rome, but it's an important lesson to understand that the office of the kingship, or in the future it will be the Nasiship, is an important hereditary office. But here we have Esau Rome, uh, is heavily involved both in the UN and in the URI, the United Religions Initiative. And what these indicate is that we've got man over scripture. Uh, it's not a case where we have uh, white horse ideals are over all, or even black horse or green horse ideals are over all. Uh, what we have is an appeal basically to the least common denominator, and that has been uh, the method employed is to create the broadest, easiest road possible by accommodating as much as possible all sorts of pagan idol worship. And then we notice that in recent years, the papacy also has been in favor of communism and these sorts of things. They speak in favor of socialism, particularly these, these last two popes. But the combined effect of this thing of breaking down Yahweh's order takes peace from the earth. So we saw uh, a redistricting of power in 1776, the break up the British Empire. Uh, all these things we'll see are important. They have to happen. Uh, Karl Marx there, I uh, don't know if it shows up with his hand hidden, uh, Karl Marx being a hidden Masonic Lodge agent. But basically that's what the red horse does is the red horse takes peace from the earth because it takes away Yahweh's correct order from the earth. So let's meet now the black horse controller of the red horse. So in Revelation 6, starting in verse 5, it says, When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. 
and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. So basically, effectively, in the black horse's world, everything has a price. So money is being the end object as opposed to uh, other ideals. So we, if we think about the black horse, we think about the global money power. And we think about Judah and Judaism primarily because of the Rothschild dynasty, which is the most prominent member of the Crown Corporation. Uh, they also are extensively involved, if don't outright control, the Bank of International Settlements, the International Monetary Fund, the U.S. Federal Reserve. Uh, they are likely what Revelation refers to as the synagogue of Satan because the Rothschild family is on record as having funded Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. Uh, of course, the synagogue of Satan is also tied into the Illuminati. But and we're also going to see in future parts of this video that Black Horse controls the Red Horse because the Red Horse claims to be not swayable, but the Black Horse knows much better than that. And we'll talk how that plays into Babylon and that progression. We come to Revelation 6 and verse 7. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a green horse. King James reads pale, but we'll see it's green. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed after him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, and that's about how much of the landmass Islam controls, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. So King James Version tells us it's a pale horse, but when we look it up, it's Strong's New Testament 5515, which is chloros, which translates to greenish color, uh, much like chlorophyll is green. And there's some other alternative definitions there, but uh, basically, effectively, it's green. So how does this manifest in real life, this green horse? Well, if we take a look, uh, most of the flags of the original 12 Muslim nations have the four colors of the apocalypse in their flag. For example, this is the Palestinian flag, which has the colors white, red, black, and green, the colors of the four horses. So this would be the Jordanian flag, also having white, red, black, and green. That's a strong coincidence there, a very strong similarity. Here we have the Kuwaiti flag. Are we noticing any patterns? White, red, black, and green, four colors of the apocalypse. So here we have the Syrian flag, white, red, black, and green. And here's the Afghani flag. We could go on, white, red, black, and green. But green is the primary of all of these colors. So if we had to use one color to explain the four horses, we would uh, go, or excuse me, one color for Islam, we would go with green. So this is a generic, if it's a green colored Saudi flag. Uh, this is also, here's a Hamas, it's dual purpose. It's either a headband or an armband. Uh, here it's being worn as a headband. And we'll talk later about how the mark of the beast is worn either on the forehead or on the right arm. And we'll talk about this as one of the multiple marks of the beast. So again, when we take a look at the green horse, just to sum the green horse up, we're taking a look. It's, we know the color is green because of chloros. Uh, and then we know that the green horse is associated with judgment. We'll take a look at him more in the narrative. And then the green, color green is often associated with envy. And we know that Ishmael scoffed or mocked at Isaac. And we also know there's the correspondence with Ishmael and Islam. So now the order, the, it's been remarked that the four horses also appear in the book of Zechariah, only they appear in a slightly different order. So instead of white leading the pack, white, uh, white is number three in the sequence. So first is Esau is red, then black, then white. And it's not green in Zechariah, but we'll see that it corresponds nonetheless to Ishmael. 
So if we come then to Zechariah chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it says, Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains. And we'll see that mountains represent governments. And the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses, which we will see is Esau and also democracy and populism. And with the second chariot, black horses, means referring to Judah and his money power. And with the third chariot, white horses, representing Joseph and Ephraim. And with the fourth chariot, we'll see dappled horses. And this is, but this is still referring to Ishmael. It says they are all strong steeds. So we take a look at the uh, word for dappled. So it's Berudim, which is Strong's Old Testament 1261, Barod, and it's basically it means spotted as if with hail. Uh, and there's a number of other translation. King James Version reads grizzled, uh, but basically we're going to see that it's, it is Ishmael. It's the same group of people. So verse 4, Then I answered and said to the messenger or the angel who talked with me, So what are these, my master? And the messenger answered and said to me, These are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Adon or the royalty, meaning the king of all the earth. So these are four spirits. They come from Yahweh and they've gone out and they all have their proper places. But right now they're marshalling uh, the forces of earth over thousands of years to get the forces where he wants them to be uh, for the time of the harvests. So going back to Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 6, he says, the one with the black horses, referring to Judah, is going to the north country. And that's referring, we remember from part one, that's Japhethite Christian Europe. He says in the white, referring to Joseph, are going after them. So this is the north country. This is Japhethite Christian Europe. And ordinarily we think about the Christians being there and then maybe the Jews coming along. But at least in a spiritual sense, uh, Judah led into Europe. And we know that historically there's been a lot of uh, European Jewry, even in areas that were not yet Christianized. But the two do tend to go hand in hand. Jews and Christians, uh, historically, they travel well together. And he says, Zechariah 6 and verse 6 in the second half, he says, and the dappled, meaning Ishmael, are going toward the south country. So again, this is the south country, as we saw earlier in part one, uh, with Israel, land of Israel, in the upper left-hand corner of the image. Then we have the wilderness of Paran, which lies directly to the south, which is the south country. This is where Ishmael dwelt. It's also where uh, Mecca and Medina are located, and it's where Muhammad uh, first basically gave rise to Islam. So it's in the Saudi Arabian and Peninsula. So we know Islam began in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, in dark red there, and then it spread throughout the close areas of Asia and then into Africa and from there. Now Esau, with the red horse, remember, so Esau dwelt from part one, Esau dwelt in Mount Seir, which lays approximately halfway in between the northern edge of the wilderness of Paran and the land of Israel. So this, I believe, helps to explain the close correspondence between the Pope and the Muslim people, as that the, there's symbolism in the fact that the papacy lies halfway in between the Judah and Joseph and Ishmael and that the Pope is used basically as a go-between between the two. And this is also one way how the Pope is attempting to appeal to the greatest number of people, which is the principle that the papacy works on. We could also take a look at the fact in the UN, there's a lot of collusion between Esau, meaning the UN and also Rome, the Vatican, and Ishmael. There's a lot of collusion between the two. And one of the reasons for this might be found in Genesis 36 and verse, starting in verse 2, where we find out that Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, uh, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, Oholibamah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite. It says in verse 3, and Basmat, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nevayot. So what we see is that, at least in uh, spiritual and prophetic terms, 
Esau and Ishmael, their lines are intermarried. So this explains why the two of them tend to work together so much. But Zechariah 6 and verse 7, it says, Then the strong steeds went out, eager to go. They want to do their job. They want to carry their messages throughout the earth. It says, eager to go, that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, go, walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. Verse 8, and he called to me and spoke to me, saying, see, those who go toward the north country, meaning Judah and Joseph, have given rest to my spirit in the north country. And what this means is that uh, Yahweh likes it when Jews and Joes are dwelling together in the same area. It produces a harmony. So and people say, how can I remember all this? Let's just remember in uh, closing and in preparation, the parable of the pregnant bride. So for hundreds of years, this is where we're at right now. We're, in the, we're describing these first four horses that are part, they, they, and they're going to go through, and they're going to maneuver forces on earth to get forces on earth ready for this final coming cataclysm. So we've just done the opening of the seals, and we're trying to lay the groundwork for understanding what's about to come next. So if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to get a copy of Revelation in the End Times available from www.nazarenisrael.org. Hope to see you in part three where we talk about seals five, six, and seven. Shalom.